me say welcome again. Uh, what a great joy realizing that we've and you've taken the opportunity to be here together with me today. We're now into part three on our upper room lessons. And as just a quick review, our first lesson was on love that Jesus taught there in John chapter 13. Our second lesson, which was just last week, was about heaven. Uh, that we found the revelation of that here in the beginning of John chapter 14. And we're going to continue in John 14. So if you have your Bible or if you uh, can take just a moment, go and grab your Bible and open up with me uh, to the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter. I'm really just going to pick up right where I left off uh, last week as we jump into this third lesson at, uh, here in the upper room. And, and the subject of uh, today's teaching is going to be on Jesus' promises that we find in, in verses uh, 7 uh, through 31 here of John chapter 14. is just a little review uh, back from last week. If you recall with me, Jesus had been preparing his disciples for his imminent departure, and he told them why he was going, which was to prepare a place for them that we discovered right there in John chapter 14, verse 2. His assurance of coming back uh, for them had to be, I would think, calming uh, to their hearts. But at the same time, they wondered how they would cope, how they could exist without him during the absence or his absence before he was going to come back uh, and to receive them. Every day, Jesus had been with them, answering their questions, directing their thoughts, settling various arguments that they would have, and strengthening them by his very own presence. Now, as we reflect on last week, he had shared with them that he was going to, to be leaving them, that they would be like orphans without a home, we would say. As a partial explanation, Jesus told them once again, as a quick reminder in John 14, verse 4, you know the place to where I am going. And then the very next verse, verse 5, Thomas asked that question, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And, and then Jesus gives them, and I would say gives us, that great statement that we reflected on at the conclusion of last week in verse 6, uh, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he finishes that up by stating, no one comes to the Father except through me. And it's right there where I want to pick up uh, in the very next verse uh, for the remainder of the opportunity that you and I have together uh, today. John chapter 14, uh, pick up with me in the seventh verse. It reads, Jesus says, if you really knew me, you would know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said in verse eight, Lord, show us the father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen, has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. And let me conclude this in verse 11. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidences of the miracles themselves. Over the next few moments, I, I, I want us to focus in on five promises that Jesus gives us in verse 7, uh, all the way to the end of, of the 14th chapter here of the Gospel of John. And I believe what this uncovers is a more complete answer over, the next, over these next few verses uh, in regards to the question to Thomas when he asked, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And, and Jesus gives us that wonderful statement in verse 6, and then he gives us a more complete answer to that question over the conclusion of chapter 14. And we're going to uncover five promises once again uh, that Jesus gives us. The first we just read, and here it is, the promise of knowing the Father through Jesus. Uh, one more time, number one, the promise of knowing the Father through Jesus. If you know Jesus, he says, you know God. The knowledge of Jesus that stops uh, with the man and the martyr, we would say the, the teacher and the brother is only a partial knowledge of Jesus. And with that would only be a partial knowledge of God. And it's in Jesus that we fully see God. 
Uh, you, you probably have seen a little boy uh, that looked like and talked like and uh, walked like his father. Many people would say of that little boy, he is a spitting image of his dad. Jesus teaches us the same thing about him and his father, God. For to see Jesus is to see the Father. If you want to know how God feels about humanity, see Jesus as he talked and walked with the lady at the well there in John chapter 4. If you want to know how God feels about those who are sick and suffering, see Jesus healing the blind, healing the crippled, and also healing the leper. If you want to know how God feels about grief, see Jesus there at the tomb of Lazarus in, jo Lazarus in John chapter 11. If you want to know how God feels about children, listen to Jesus here in Luke chapter 18 verse 6 when he says, let the children come unto me. If you want to know how God feels about sinners, uh, those that have walked in mistake and failure and failure and failure. See Jesus dealing with Zacchaeus there in Luke chapter 19 verses 1 through 10. Here Zacchaeus hears that Jesus is passing through his town. And so he, he journeys out and there's a crowd of people and Zacchaeus being little can't, can't, can't see Jesus. But he desperately wants to see him. And the story tells us that he, he climbs up in a tree, a sycamore tree. And as Jesus passes by, he sees Zacchaeus the sinner up there in the tree, and he calls him down, and he goes to the house of Zacchaeus. And there at the end of that story, we get that wonderful, another wonderful statement in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, where Jesus says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. It's in Jesus that we discover and understand who Father God really is and how much God loves each one of us. So number one, one last time, the first promise is the promise of knowing the Father through Jesus. Number two, that he gives his disciples, and we're going to read it, is the promise of greater works. Pick up with me in verse 12. It reads, I, I tell you, I tell you uh, the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask for anything in my name, and Jesus declares, I will do it. Secondly, the second promise, once again, is the promise of greater works. The disciples had, had seen Jesus do many miraculous works some of which we mentioned just before about the healing of the blind, the healing of the crippled, the, the healing of the leper. But, but how about the miraculous feedings that Jesus did? Uh, what about the calming of the, the great storm, the, the raising of the dead? The list could go on and on about the miraculous things that Jesus did. But here in verses 12 through 14, he encourages his disciples by, by saying to them that, that they would do even greater works. So I think the question begs to be asked, did they do greater works? And I would submit to you the answer is yes. Look what happened there on the day of Pentecost, uh, uh, when and after they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus wanted, to, wanted them to know that His power, His Spirit, the Holy Spirit would reside in them and then would enable them to do greater things unto the glory of God, just as Jesus talked about right here. So the second promise was the promise of greater works. Uh, the third promise was the promise of a helper who we recognize is the Holy Spirit. Pick up with me in the 15th verse. It reads, if you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He continues, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. He declares, because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. 
He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Verse 22, then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to, to him and make our home with him. He who does he who does not love me will not obey my teachings. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who has sent me. Once again, the third promise is the promise of the Helper, the Holy Spirit. Here Jesus promised not to leave the disciples as helpless orphans. He promised that through the Holy Spirit, He would come to them. He promised them a, an abiding presence that would bring them love in obedience. Think about this through scripture with me in just a, uh, just for a few moments. In, in Acts chapter 1, there Jesus commissions them to that, that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on them and that they would be his witness in all Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. And then we skip ahead into Acts chapter 2 and we, receive, and we recognize the infilling of that power, the infilling of the Holy Spirit within their life is, is classified there as on, on the day of Pentecost, and we jump ahead another chapter into Acts chapter 3, and, and right there we see the disciples working by the power uh, of the Holy Spirit to provide healing to that crippled beggar, and then they continue to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit and the abiding presence of Christ in and through their life all throughout the rest of the book of Acts. And then we jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, and we find this beautiful statement from the Apostle Paul. He says, Do you not know that you yourselves are God's temple, and that God's Spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred. And look how it ends. You are that temple. You and I are the temple of God. We we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the abiding presence of Christ that lives and dwells in us and enables us and it empowers us to do the greater works. And it's the promise of the helper, the Holy Spirit within each one of our lives. And it leads us to the fourth promise, the promise of the blessing through the Holy Spirit. Uh, continue with me in verse 25. It reads, All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. Once again, the fourth promise is the promise of the blessings through the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised the Holy Spirit as our advocate there in verse 26. An advocate is one who is summoned to assist another in the court of law, or we would say the court of justice. The advocate was to be Christ's representative. What? One in the place of Christ, being our helper, our advocate, the Holy Spirit. He would guide the disciples in truth and help them recall everything that Jesus had told them there in verse 26. During the events that unfolded in the lives of the apostles. They did remember the words that Jesus had spoken to them before his crucifixion, and they understood them. They understood the words of Jesus in a new light. Why? Because of the blessing of the Holy Spirit within their lives. I want you to realize today that that, that blessing of the Holy Spirit is also available for you just as it's available, available for me. The Holy Spirit can help us to fully understand the words of God. The, the Holy Spirit helps to enlighten God's truth, God's word, the Bible to each one of us so that we more effectively live for Him. It's hearing, it's easier to live that effective life that, that God has purpose for us when we better understand His truth, His word. And I believe that's one of the great blessings of the Holy Spirit into your life, just as it's one of the great blessings of the Holy Spirit into my life. And lastly for you, the fifth promise is the promise of peace. Let's read it together for just a moment. Pick up with me in the 27th verse. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. 
I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Verse 28, you heard me say, I'm going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not speak with you much longer, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me, he says, and he concludes in verse 31, But the world must learn that I love the Father, and that I do exactly what the Father has commanded me. Come now. Let us leave. Once again, the last promise, number five, is the promise of peace. I've said this with each one of our teachings in the upper room lessons, and I'll say it once again. Jesus did not promise that their lives would be easy. What he does promise right here is peace. The peace that Jesus promised was a a triumphant overcoming, we would say, of the difficulties and the problems of life. The world often thinks of peace as being, a, being that peace where there is no more pain and no more sorrow. What I would classify as a, a peace of escape. But the peace that Jesus gives is referred to as shalom, a, a shalom peace, which means everything that makes for our highest good. Once again, shalom, that being everything that makes for our highest good. It's a peace that is independent, we would say, of our outward circumstances. Archibald Rutledge visited an old man living alone in an isolated area, and he said to the old man, you must mind being all alone like this. The old man looked up and answered, Mr. Rutledge, I'm not exactly alone. I miss all who are gone, but I'm yet not alone. Mr. Rutledge replied, Someone else has been here to see you then? I'm mighty glad to hear of that. Captain, said the old man, You know who I mean. He was my first friend in life, and he will also be my last friend. Same as he is to you. Jesus doesn't come to see me. He stays with me all of the time. For I'm not lonely, for Jesus is yet still with me. Friend, it's the abiding presence of Jesus in our life that brings that peace. That peace is available for you, just as that peace is available for me. The the presence of Jesus, I would submit to you, what a joy to walk with Jesus. What a joy to be able to walk in the abiding presence of Jesus Christ and realizing it's with that presence that we can walk with peace, realizing that God is in control of all things. And so let me draw this to a conclusion for us. Today, by faith, you as well as I can appropriate the promises that Jesus has made for us, just as he made for the disciples. I believe that they're they're available for you and they're available for me that we find right here in, in John chapter 14. Once again, uh, uh, Jesus uh, shares with them that he's going away to prepare a place and that if he goes away, that he would come back. And he, he declares that they know the way. And then there in, in, in chapter 5, Thomas asked him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus responds, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He continues, no one comes to the Father except through me. And here on these verses that we just, we just reflected on, he gives us these five promises. Let me give them to you one last time. The promise of knowing Father God through Jesus Christ. And these promises were simply to bring comfort, further comfort into the life of his disciples, just as they can bring further comfort into our life. The second promise was the promise of greater works. The third promise was the promise of a helper, the Holy Spirit. The fourth promise was the promise of blessings that would come through the work of the Holy Spirit into our lives. And the last was the promise of peace. These were promises to bring comfort into his disciples' life, realizing that their life wouldn't be easy. But through that peace, they could have that overcoming triumph of the difficulties and the troubles of life, the comfort that would be needed to journey through this life 
And I want you to know that that comfort, these promises are available for you today. It's your choice, just as it is my choice, to receive the promises of Jesus, to hold on to these promises, and to walk in these promises and realizing it's through the promises of Jesus that we can experience the great victories of life and I don't know about you, but I want those victories. And I and I believe those victories for you. And so I want to take a moment and pray with you. And to believe, and to believe these promises that you, just as well as I, would grab a hold of these promises, live by these promises, and walk in the victory that God purposed for his disciples. And that I believe that God has purpose for each one of us today. Let us pray. Father, I just say thank you. Lord, for this beautiful opportunity that we've been able to have together. God, to spend reflection. God, in your word. God, and I pray that your word would would be seed that would be deposited in each one of our lives. God, and that your word is is taking root right now. Lord, in, in my life as well as my friend's life. God, that it grows. God, that it it accomplishes that which you have purposed it to accomplish. Lord, in today's word was about the promises of your son, Jesus. God, and I pray that we would grab a hold of these promises. God, that we would hold firm to these promises. God, that we would live in the revelation of these promises. God, and that my friend, just as well as I, would live in the victory of Jesus Christ. And as we live in that victory, we live in peace. And I don't believe that peace is the absence of problems. It's not the absence of of difficulties. Peace is what enables us to have triumph over those problems and those difficulties. God, so I pray the blessing of your peace, Lord, into my friend's life today. God, and that we have an unbelievable week, Lord, walking in your abiding presence every day. God, believing that your will would be accomplished in us and through us. And I pray this to be so in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for taking this opportunity once again to grow with me in God's Word. And let me just give you a a little insight. Next week will be our our last within this study of Upper Room Lessons. It'll be our fourth teaching and will be a lesson on relationships that we'll discover from Jesus. I pray you have a tremendous remainder of the week. Be blessed.